This is the Supermicro. This 821GETNHR are also known as the 8U air-cooled GPU server. Inside of here, we have the NVIDIA HGX H200 8GPU platform. That means that we have the newest Hopper GPUs with over 1.1 terabytes of HBM 3E memory on board across all the 8 GPUs. In addition, we have a ton of networking. You can see that we have plenty of storage and we have two CPUs with lots of memory. So I figure, why don't we get to the hardware and go see what makes this special. As a quick note, Supermicro had to go and pull this expensive system out of its rack and it was also less expensive to fly George and I to go see the system than it was to send the system to us. So we are going to have to say this is a sponsored video because of that. Now, the first thing you might be wondering is why is this an 8U server? Well, let me tell you that there are a couple of reasons. And if you are not in the industry and you don't really know, and you're just kind of getting to this for the first time, the reason this is an 8U server is it gives you a little bit more room. If you had a 6U server, like a lot of competitors, well, you have an air-cooled server, but you don't have a huge front faceplate, so you can't really, you have to push air through at a lot faster rate, and that uses more energy. If you have an 8U server, it means that you can be more efficient with your fans. But there are some other benefits as well. From a serviceability standpoint, you're gonna see why this is much faster to service than a lot of those 6U options and also why this ended up being one of Supermicro's best-selling servers, especially on the GPU side. And the 8U is partitioned into a couple of ways on the outside, and then it looks very different, or at least somewhat different on the inside. And let me show you a couple examples. On the bottom portion here, you're gonna see that we have a bunch of U.2, so you have a lot of NVMe storage. Then above that, you're gonna see that we have five fan modules, and we're gonna explain exactly what those cool inside the system when we get inside. And then on top, you can see that we have this 4U tray, and that's really for our NVIDIA HGX H200 8GPU baseboard. Now, the top part of this is clearly the heart of the system because this is a tray, and you can take these two little latches and pull it out, and what you have in here is the NVIDIA HDX H200 8GPU baseboard. These are using the new H200 generation of Hopper GPUs. Each one of these GPUs has your Hopper GPU portion, but then the memory is upgraded to 141 gigabytes of HBM3E memory. Now, if you're familiar with HBM3E memory, you'll realize that 141 kind of looks a little bit weird when you just kind of say like, how much capacity should you have? Doesn't feel like you should have 144 gigabytes. The reason that you have 141 gigabytes is because these chips are so complex that for yield reasons, NVIDIA actually makes a little part of one of the HBM controllers on each of the GPUs inactive, so that way it gets higher yield. So that's the reason that we have 141 gigabytes per GPU. Okay, so on this board, you can see that we have our eight Hopper GPUs, but there's a lot more here. For example, on this section right here, you can see that we have four heat sinks. These four heat sinks are for the NVLink switches. So NVIDIA has a switched architecture, which allows for high-speed communication between all of its GPUs with lots and lots of bandwidth. This is something that's different on the NVIDIA platform versus a lot of the other platforms that use point-to-point -point connections. Now, on the connector side of the baseboard, what you're gonna see is that we have these other heat sinks. You might wonder what those are. Those are for the Astera Labs PCIe Gen 5 retimers, and those make sure that the signal from the GPUs can reach the CPUs and PCIe switches and vice versa. And then on the edge of the baseboard, you're gonna see a number of high density connectors, and these are really for the data and power connections from the baseboard to the rest of the system. Now, the bottom for you of the system is really where we have the CPU, memory, PCIe switches, and a lot of the connectivity. Now here, you're gonna see five fan modules. These fan modules provide a lot of the cooling for this bottom portion of the chassis, and they're super easy to swap out. You just pull one out, and uh, there you go. Ready to go pop a new one in if you ever need to. Now, on the bottom of this, we have 16 NVMe bays, and these are U.2 NVMe, so you can put fast drives, you can put large drives. Usually in servers like these, the local storage, you would see the very fast PCIe Gen 5 storage, whereas you would see the high capacity storage on the network. The other thing though, is that you're gonna see that we have three SATA drives. And these three SATA drives are for things like if you want an OS drive or something like that, this is a SATA drive, but it's 7.68 terabytes. So it's pretty large in this particular system. And then there's an option to go and add another five SATA drives here where we have our front IO. Let's talk about this front IO and why you have front IO in a system like this. So by having a management port to USB ports and also VGA port, you have all the things that you need to go and manage the server if you ever had to manage it remotely, whether that's remote over the network or if you wanted to go and put a KVM cart and do local management. That local management from this side may not seem like a big deal. Why do you want it? 
Well, because if you're on the backside of air-cooled GPU servers, it gets very warm and there is a ton of airflow going by you. So some people just like the fact that you can go into a cold aisle and hook up a KVM cart to a connection like this and stay nice and cool. Now, one of the other really cool features, and that's very different about this system versus some of the other systems in the market, is that this system has a CPU and memory tray that's a tray, and it's not just a motherboard that sits on the top of the system. This does two things. Number one, it helps with the electrical connectivity and the trace lengths between the motherboard and various components. But the other thing that it does, and uh, really practically, is that if you want to go and service a system, instead of having to go and pull the system out of the rack and then go and open up the top of the server, well, you can just go and uh, pull these latches. And these latches allow you to get into the motherboard area and do things like replace memory. You can swap out your CPUs if you wanted. You can re-cable things. Whatever you need to do, you can go service that by just pulling out the motherboard tray. And before we get inside, one other really just kind of fun thing is that you can order replacement units for the HGX baseboard as well as the motherboard. So if you have like a bunch of these in a data center because you're doing like high-end AI training inference, if you just want to service things very quickly, you can literally just get spares. You can replace these things wholesale and just go boom, put a new one in and have the system fire right back up. So you don't have to wait to go and replace things. So from a serviceability standpoint, that's something that a lot of folks don't think of. They think that a lot of servers are all the same, a lot of GPU servers are all the same, but this is really designed to be the most serviceable system on the market. Now, looking inside the CPU tray, there's a lot of really fun design elements here that I just want to go through real quick. So first off, this is the Intel version of the system. So you have two Intel Xeon processors. Now, of course, this is a hopper generation system. So we have a fourth and fifth generation Sapphire Rapids and Emerald Rapids Intel Xeon. Now, one of the advantages with this platform is that you have eight channel memory with two DIMMs per channel, which means that you get 16 DIMMs per CPU, 32 DIMMs total, and that means that you can get a lot of memory. Remember, you have over 1.1 terabytes of HBM 3E memory, and a lot of folks like to have, you know, at least twice that in system memory. So if you have to get a lot of memory, one way you can do that is just simply having lots and lots of DIMMs. Having 32 DIMM slots is Great. If you have a larger socket CPU, a lot of times that means that you're only going to get 24 DIMMs, which means you need higher capacity DIMMs, and oftentimes that costs more. So there's a real practical reason that having eight channel memory and having two DIMMs per channel in a system like this is pretty awesome. Now, one of the other cool innovations is that there's a pretty elaborate PCIe switch scheme in this. And what I mean by that is that this is the main PCIe switchboard. And so you're gonna see our PCIe switches and on each of the four switches, there are a total of two GPUs, two NICs, one for each GPU, and also two NVMe SSDs. There's then links from the switch back to the CPU. And that's really replicated four times. And that gives us our eight GPUs, eight NICs for those GPUs, eight SSDs for those GPUs, and then links back to the CPUs. But of course, the CPUs, they also like to have their own NICs for our north-south network. And for that, we have these switchboards that are on the side. And these have not just the switches that give us the connectivity to our NICs in the back, but they also provide more connectivity for that front panel NVMe. So that's the way that this 8U system is able to fit a ton of PCIe connectivity into a single box. And the reason I wanted to show off the system is that this is the older style of MCO cable, which is like a rounded cable. There's a new flat style cable that hopefully you can see here and here. And this is the new generation of cable that gives a lot cleaner cable management. And so that's something that is gonna be changing and you can kind of see both versions of this, the older generation and newer generation in the server. And under this, you're gonna see that you have your two M.2 NVMe boot drives. Okay, so moving to the back of the system, there is a lot going on here and you're gonna notice that we have a ton of fans. Now, you'll also remember that we have fans on the front and you're gonna see a bunch of fans that look very similar on the back. In fact, if I take this out, you might say, hey, this is the same fan and in a lot of ways it is, but there is a very big difference. These fans push air out of the chassis. The front fans pull air into the chassis, so they're actually oriented differently. Supermicro has this little keying system to make sure that you don't put the wrong fan on the wrong side because they look so similar. That's just a little tiny bit, but they've been doing this for so many years that they have little optimizations of little tricks like this. Now, of course, those are only five of the fans. There's another six fans that you're gonna see in the back. 
And there's a little bit of a uh, little bit of difference between these. They may all look the same, but you're gonna notice these two look a little different. So starting out with these fans, you're gonna see that this is actually a giant fan module but it's a giant fan module that is in the shape of a power supply. So these are optional. And so you have two options. You have standard where you have these just fan modules, but there's an option to actually upgrade these to full power supplies. So if you want to have full redundancy and four, four power supplies and four power supplies, you can actually upgrade these, but instead you have four plus two now. Speaking of the power supplies, these are giant power supplies that are three kilowatts each. And beyond being just three kilowatts, they have a important distinction because they're in this type of server. Because they're in this GPU server and because the NVIDIA HGX H200 HGPU baseboard is a 54 volt design, but your normal server is a 12 volt design, these have two rails so they can output both voltages and power both sides of the system. Some other vendors have a split power supply design where they use different types of power supplies, but these are all the same, so you can just plug them in wherever you want. Now there are six power supplies in this and they're three kilowatts each, which might seem huge for a normal server, but for a GPU server, that's pretty par for the course. Of course, that means that you have three kilowatt power supplies times six of them, which means you have about 18 kilowatts of power that this can give you just in a standard configuration. In the redundant configuration, you would have a total of 24 kilowatts of power supplies. Now a server like this at idle, if it ever was idle, would be somewhere a little under maybe two kilowatts or so. On the top end, it can use about 10 kilowatts. So even though you have all of these power supplies, that's really your range that you would expect. Then that really depends, of course, on what the GPUs are doing. But next, let's get to what some would call the big show. Well, at least not the GPU big show, but the next biggest show, which would be the networking. The networking on this is fascinating. You're gonna see that we have eight NICs in the center. Now these are actually NVIDIA Bluefield 3 Super NICs, which are east to west NICs. So each one of these is a 400 gigabit per second ethernet NIC, and that allows you to go scale up on NVIDIA's fabric. So you can have a bunch of GPUs, like thousands and thousands of GPUs, just using ethernet as your scale up fabric. And although we have the NVIDIA Bluefield 3 Super NICs here, they are something that you could customize. So if you wanted to go build out an InfiniBand network, you could put an NVIDIA Connect X7 just array in here as well. You could change your Bluefield 3 DPUs to something else if you wanted to. There's a lot of options. In addition, you're gonna see that we have a number of NICs on either side. The two that I think a lot of STH readers are gonna notice right away are the NVIDIA Bluefield 3 DPUs. The NVIDIA Bluefield 3 DPUs are our north-south NICs, and those are really for our communication from like our CPUs and our Xeons all the way out to the rest of the network. You may need that for some kind of storage applications or whatever you're doing, um, but that's really the path for those. And then there's some just kind of fun things. For example, you're gonna see that we have dual 10 gig networking here, and that's really just for things like if you wanna do network boot or have some kind of management interface or something like that, you wanna do that, you have some relatively low speed NICs here because you'll notice that we already have 10 400 gig NICs that we've talked about. Now, in addition to those 400 gig NICs, there's also one more NVIDIA Connect X7, which is an InfiniBand. It can also, you know, there's ethernet versions of that as well, but we have another NIC there if you just wanted to add a little bit more networking. And even without that Connect X7, we have a total of 10 400 gigabit NICs, which means we have a total of four terabits of bandwidth just on the back of this single server. That may not seem like a lot, but let me give you just kind of two facts. The first fact is that one 400 gig connection is more bandwidth than you had PCIe connectivity coming out of a first generation or second generation Intel Xeon scalable processor. In addition, four terabits per second is more than the classic 100 gigabit 32 port switch has total. So when we talk about bandwidth of a modern GPU server, if you're still on 100 gigabit ethernet, well, this has more bandwidth than a lot of the switches that you would see. And one final fun little bit. You might remember that when we looked at the CPU tray, we had that four Broadcom PCIe switch board that was there, and we had those two boards on the side. Well, that is actually mirrored on the back. On the back, you'll see that we have these eight NVIDIA Bluefield 3 Super NICs, and those align to that center four Broadcom PCIe switch board. So that's kind of how that works. And then on each side, we have those Bluefield 3 DPUs, and those are plugged into the CPU side for north-south traffic, 
and those align to the PCIe switch ports that are on the side of the chassis here. So overall, the NICs actually align to the overall PCIe switch architecture in the system. Now this NIC tray has another exciting little feature because it's not just a static NIC tray. When we say it's a tray, it's literally because you can go and you can pull this NIC tray out. So if you need to go and service your network cards, well, now you have a tray, you don't have to pull your entire system out, you have to do all kinds of gyrations to get to your NICs, you can go replace things very easily here. You don't need to pull the system out to go access memory, to go change your NICs out, to go do things like service a GPU or something like that. You can just walk up, pull the part that you need out or the assembly that you need out, work on whatever you need, maybe put another one in if you don't have the part on hand and you're ready to go. This is so much faster than some of the other systems on the market. With that, let's talk a little bit about performance. Now, something interesting on the performance side of this, we tend not to see a big difference between the air-cooled and liquid-cooled versions when we're talking about the maximum performance of the NVIDIA H200 GPUs. One of the reasons for the system being so large is because, well, Supermicro is able to actually cool the system without an issue. Where you do tend to see a bit of a difference is really in terms of power consumption when you look at the air-cooled versus the liquid-cooled version. Of course, this thing is easily able to go and use up to, you know, 10 kilowatts, no problem, maybe even a little bit more than that. But if you had the liquid cooled version, all of that fan power would be transferred to somewhere else in the rack or in the data center. So you wouldn't necessarily have that power consumption in the server itself. And also it just tends to use less power if you do liquid cooling versus air cooling. But in terms of performance, we get the same results on the liquid cooled versus air cooled version. So it's not really that interesting. We've even done this all the way back into the, I think, Ampere generation, the A100 generation. We did this with Supermicro. And so what do we learn in the process? To me, the biggest takeaway is that Supermicro has a bunch of different types of form factors for its GPU servers. And what I mean by that is it doesn't just have GPU servers that are air-cooled and liquid-cooled. It has Intel versions, it has AMD versions. They're all different types of versions of this and you can get an H100, H200 in the future, of course, Blackwell. And so there are a whole bunch of different GPU options, CPU options, form factors. And one of the reasons that this air-cooled form factor is a little bit larger is just because, well, frankly, folks can't power that many systems in most racks just to power a 10 kilowatt-ish system, maybe even a little bit more than that, you know, what are you gonna get? Maybe you're gonna get six in a rack, maybe, but realistically, you're probably gonna get fewer than that. And so just as the system gets a little bit larger, you don't necessarily need that maximum density unless you're gonna really go into things like liquid cooling. So the main advantage of doing this larger air-cooled H200 system versus something like a 6U is that you get to use larger fans. And the other thing that you're gonna see, and you've probably seen a lot in our hardware overview, is just that when you have that larger chassis, you have a little bit more expandability and it makes it a little easier to service. Supermicro has been making these big AI servers. We've been testing them since what, like 2016, something like that, 2015. And so, you know, they've just gone through so many iterations that everything in the server is really designed to be optimized for that air-cooled rack. But of course, we've already shown you the liquid-cooled version of this. We've shown you the 4U liquid-cooled versions. And so there's a lot of options here. But hey, I'd love to hear what you guys think. And if you did like this video, well, why don't you first share with your friends, but also give it a like, click subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, Thanks for watching, have an awesome day.